I'm Brittany Abshore, and this is the Proof of Plant-Based Living. It's the story of how food can change our lives, the power of nutrition. With the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and Armstrong Neighborhood Channel, we'll unravel the complex mystery of why health eludes some and embraces others. Americans need to know the truth. Through expert interviews, we'll uncover the research explaining why we're unnecessarily sick, why we're dying early despite trillions spent in healthcare, and why a system that's supposed to help us often hurts us. And we'll share stories of hope, those who took back their health simply by changing their diet, reversing heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. The evidence is clear. The key to a long, healthy life is in breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm Brittany Absher, and welcome to The Proof of Plant-Based Living, where we talk to experts and everyday people about the power of a whole food, plant-based diet, sharing success stories from those who have changed their lives and even cured their diseases by simply changing how they eat. And today we're talking to Kate McGoy-Smith. 10 years ago, she was a type two diabetic. She was blind, she was terminally ill, and she was in need of a lung transplant. She relied on oxygen and a long list of medications in order to survive until she adopted a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Kate, thank you so much for talking to me today. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, this started in 2006, I believe, when you were this busy working mom of uh, three kids. Um, yes. I think your husband at that time called you the Energizer Bunny until you started to notice <laughs> there were some changes in how you felt. Talk about that. Yes, well, I was very busy. Um, being a mom of three, homework helper, as most mothers are. And I also had a, uh, a private practice. I'm a master level uh, social worker in clinical concentration. I'm a former registered nurse. And then I was responsible for starting a free on-site counseling program for an entire school board for kids from pre-kindergarten to grade 12 and their families. And I ended up supervising 12 counselors in 13 school sites. So I was extremely busy. I had initiated the program and then I was the clinical supervisor and manager of it. So uh, it was either I was at work or at home with the kids. And uh, I started to notice that I had increasingly um, less energy. And that wasn't like me. I really loved my work. I jumped out of bed. I was excited. And um, all of a sudden, it was taking me longer to get dressed and just do daily activities of living. And um, it got to the point where I had this tremendous uh, abdominal and lower leg swelling, so much so that when I, you know, I'm going to be really blunt with your audience, that when I went to sit down on the toilet, it was really hard to get up because I and I was really tired. And I began to almost get my pajamas at the same time as my kids that were all in uh, school at that age, school age. And uh, the weekends, I spent most of the time you know, sleeping in or having an extra nap in the afternoon. And it just gradually built from there until I sought medical help. And uh, I don't know if you, it, that's the start of the journey. And so I think your, if I remember correctly, your first diagnosis was that you had type two diabetes. In fact, when you yes. went to the doctor, your blood glucose level at that point was 15.2%. And the normal yes. range is somewhere four to six. So that was pretty shocking, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. Sort of uh, 6.5 is sort of pre-diabetic. And then seven, of course, uh, they're looking at um, like a, an oral drug like metformin or something like that to help. And I was really shocked because I was a, I had been a nurse. And I had been a nurse for a number of years. I worked in the operating room, the bedside in the community. And yet I just put it down to, you know, I have a heavy job. I busy at home with the kids, you know, coming home every night, making sure they were off for breakfast and their lunches and helping like making with dinner. My husband was a really good uh, cook in the kitchen partner. But you know, it seemed our lives really centered around our kids if it, we weren't at work. So I was really shocked at that. And um, he said to me, well, I'll give you like two weeks off to kind of get your act together. But he said, 
they also detected at the time there was something wrong with my heart. And so I had to go for investigation then. And it was there where I started because I started looking up di at diabetes and I actually came across Neil Bernard's work on uh, reversing diabetes. And that led me to start understanding it a little bit more about um, a, a whole plant-based diet, which I had never heard of before. Because even in nursing, we get little to no nutrition, maybe ways to feed patients, but we really don't get into any kind of nutritional quality of eating. We've, we've heard from those in the medical community, doctors, nurses, they, they just don't talk about nutrition when you're in medical school. It's really about, no. you know, once people get sick, it's the treating of that disease, but it's never really about getting to the root of the issue. Would you agree with that? I would. I think the, 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 the stat is about 25 hours that me mm -hmm. uh, medical students get any kind of nutrition. And the thing is that I say to people when they go, because they have so much trust in their doctor, and I totally understand that. And I would think if, you know, I've talked to many whole plant-based leaders like uh, Dr. Like Campbell, um, you know, McDougall, uh, Bernard, they all say, you know, and Esselstyn, they'll all say there's a need for acute medicine. You know, if you break your leg, you want to get treated. However, with these chronic diseases, we need to look at it a little differently. And can you imagine if a doctor had prescribed a medication that you were to take three times a day and never followed up and checked, what were the effects? What was going on with that? Like, wouldn't you wonder about that? And guess what? We eat three or more times a day, and yet we don't have any follow-up on what are you eating, what would be helpful, um, you know, avoid this, uh, eat this, that kind of thing. That difference in, in how that would play out. So around this time, <clears throat> excuse me, you get your diagnosis of the type 2 diabetes and things just sort of seem to spiral in terms of finding out more things after that. Talk about, you know, those, those next diagnoses. Yes, the next steps were that um, they, they were investigating my heart and I actually went to a specialist, a cardiac uh, specialty unit and the doctor started asking me questions like, had you traveled? Had you, um, had you ever taken Fen Fen, uh, you know, which was a diet medication at the time? Have you done any of those kind of things? Uh, um, and I said, no, not at all. I mean, I think <laughs> I, we hadn't traveled much far except to we were in Calgary. I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and going to BC. So we hadn't gone to any exotic places or anything like that. And um, I now know, I mean, then that led us to do um, uh, lots of research on the heart. It was found that um, a, radio a radiologist came out after one of the tests and uh, he, he, uh, he looked so scared that I backed up against the wall. My legs were shaking and he said, you've got to get to your doctor like right now. You have severe right-sided heart failure. Like don't don't go anywhere else, just get to your doctor and you may have to be hospitalized. And so mm -hmm. that was the start of further investigation uh, with regard to what I was going through. And uh, I was, uh, what they did is uh, I also at the same time uh, checked about sleep apnea because that was something mm -hmm. that they were wondering about. I went through screening for that. And the doctor at the time said, you know what? You have this right-sided heart failure. It's quite severe. But once you go on the sleep apnea machine, the bypass machine, um, you'll get a full night's sleep. Um, because people who don't know about sleep apnea, they may notice their partner is starting to snore and then have stops in their snoring. They'll snore and then there'll be an interval of stopping and then snoring again. And that's where you're actually, you have stopped breathing very slightly. And what's happened is your tongue is thrown back uh, into mm -hmm. your throat. And so it's a causing a blockage. So I did go through that investigation actually twice at the hospital. And uh, the doctor said the second time round, I was on the sleep apnea machine in, in between and following it being very compliant, um, mm -hmm. not missing one night uh, or not one nap if I had to have a nap. And then she said, I'm really sorry to tell you, you have something called uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension and you only have two to five years to live. 
And we just, and so she said, I'm going to put you out in the waiting room while I get the papers because you cannot work. I don't even know how you were managed to work at all wow. um, during all this part of this investigation and everything. And um, uh, literally, you know, there's a sort of humor here because my husband and I we were in total shock and we could hardly move. And this was in the basement of the, a large uh, medical hospital. And so we got our papers and I was on my way. And we went to the parking lot and then we just cried. We didn't want to cry in this full waiting room to scare anybody else. And we cried and, and we started crying and we went. And I said to him, without thinking, I said, oh my gosh, we can't afford the parking lot fees any longer. we got to get out of here and not, not be crying in the parking lot. And it's costing <laughs> us a lot of money. <laughs> so we, I said, can you drive at all? And, and you know, it's just amazing that no one said, are you okay to drive or anything when I come from my background of psychology? But we did manage to get out of the parking lot, pay for it, and then park and just cry because we were like, we had no family around, nobody else just us with raising our kids and very frightening, obviously diagnosis. This is a very rare disease. It only affects two to four in a million. So it's not something that people can put their hat on. You know, it's called uh, idiopathic. So I say, even the idiots don't know pulmonary <laughs> arterial hypertension is high blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries of the lungs. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not like when people say high blood pressure or hypertension, they think, well, everybody's got that. We sort of think it's a rite mm -hmm. of passage when you turn 40. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. But guess what? This is it specifically situated in the lungs. So you have shortness right. of breath, you yep. have swelling, you can't, you know, you have fainting spells out of the blue. Um, and three months in a patient's life like this, you could end up being flown up for a lung transplant, I say, because we're in Calgary and the transplants are done in the north of us, about four hours away in Edmonton. So it's a very fragile kind of state and they have to use experimental drugs. They haven't been able to find anything. They just try to slow it down um, mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do. Uh, there's no cause and no cure. This is unbelievable. So just to recap for everyone here at this point in 2006, you're diagnosed with type two diabetes. You have uh, sleep apnea, you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, and you also have yes. right sided failure. So you are and you're given yes. in all of this two to five years to live and you have to three live. young children. Yeah, I mean, and in fact, were you Go ahead. I was a lucky person because it took nine months to diagnose. So I actually wow. got the diagnosis in the right heart cath. They did a right heart cath to, mm -hmm. to confirm it because, and what they have to do is take a wire into your, uh, into your major artery here, go down into the chambers of your heart, through your heart into your lungs, and measure the pressures. Mm -hmm. And my pressures were very, very high. And um, I was awake during that. Uh, you have to be, and they try nitric oxide on you gases to see if that'll have an effect it didn't have any effect on me and mm -hmm. i was lucky because it usually takes two years to diagnose and by that time most people have to go right to palliative care or it mm -hmm. took nine months for me and i somehow managed to still be living uh, although guess what happened is my health began the first drug they put you on is a state level one drug i was at level mm -hmm. three out of four the diagnosis and it's sedanophil or what we know commonly as Viagra. So all of a sudden I'm taking Viagra. I have a real empathy for men in all honesty mm -hmm. of what it's like to be on Viagra. It's the flu like kind of symptom that you have all the time. And maybe some men get, uh, you know, it was actually originally uh, like used for heart drugs. Then they had a right. really interesting side effect that it helped with re erectile dysfunction. So it actually mm -hmm. lowered the cost of the drug. Um, but I can really appreciate what men go through because it was a really awful always to feel like you have the flu. And um, wow. I didn't get any other, I didn't get any... Um, nice side effects that some men get where using it i didn't get anything like that so yeah, it wasn't an equal opportunity you. drug no so um but you know you have to find the humor in all of that but what happened yeah. is i ended up actually becoming blind and um so blind that when i went to brush my teeth in the vanity mirror and you can know how close you're standing all i could see is a black hole and black here 
And if someone came to the door and it was light, I couldn't tell if they were really there until they spoke. Uh, oh I couldn't God. see anything. If I went in, on a bright sunny day, if I went into a grocery store, um, all of mm -hmm. a sudden everything would be pitch black. And I just have to be afraid. You know, you have almost that kind of feeling like, am I going to fall off a cliff because it's just a black hole? I'd have to lean against a wall to make sure and wait there until my retina could adjust. And it took about 15 minutes to adjust so that I could start seeing shadows. So I lived with that like for five years. Um, and, uh, you know, and in the meantime, did not share this with my kids. I mean, they knew I was blind. They mm -hmm. saw that getting worse. But I took treat it like sex education. They were not ready. Um, my youngest mm -hmm. was only in grade five or six at the time. And I wanted to wait till they were ready. They asked questions. I asked them not to go on the internet because it made it very clear that people all died. And most of them only lived maybe two years at max. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to handle it as I went along. So I told them two yeah. things. And I think I really borrowed from my um, social work background, my therapist background, I said, one, I'm going to take try to take worry away from you. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a commitment, I will try everything possible to get as well as possible. And the second commitment I made was I said, you know what, it's really important that no matter what we're all faced with, and I happen to be faced with this, this kind of illness, is that I have to try to find a way to make a contribution to the world and to my community. And those were the two North Stars that I lived for. Those were what I valued, what was important to me and what mattered. And uh, that led me on the journey since then. Yeah. It's amazing that you kept so positive during this time. I mean, when you're given that and, you're, and a doctor tells you you have two to five years to live, were you preparing for death? I mean, were you pretty certain you had at the most five years left with your children? I thought if I was lucky, because what I, I did read, mm -hmm. there was one, there's only one manual in all of North America. And it comes from your country in the United States, just outside, I think, Methesda, Maryland, and it's the PH uh, Can uh, American Association. And it was written uh, in conjunction with patients. And most of them when I read I kind of have a, I'm an index reader first, so I've read so much that uh, then I dip into stuff that is of interest. But I read the contributors first, most of them had died. And so it really came home. Uh, there were times I had to, you know, put down the book because I couldn't take it anymore. And so I don't want to put on to anyone who's listening right now uh, that, that, to say, I certainly I had hope that m maybe something could happen that would, you know, I, I knew that I had some I still responsibilities with my kids, which was very helpful, a very helpful distraction from it. And I had an obligation to them. However, there were certainly moments that I cried and my husband and I comforted each other. Like it was really scary because I know that he didn't want to be a parent by himself raising the kids. And so I actually went to our Canadian National Institute for the Blind. I got a special grant that would allow me to have voice activated um, uh, technology for my computer because I was trying to write goodbye stories to my kids. I had worked with teens for a number of years. I'd actually worked in Silver Spring, Maryland, and, and at Catholic, I taught at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. So I, there's many things I love about the States. I was a Nurse, operating nurse, nurse in Houston, Texas at Methodist Hospital, mm -hmm. and then over in the UK. And so I'd worked a lot with teens and stuff. So I really wanted to prepare my kids because I thought they may yeah. never get to know me uh, as they get to be teenagers, never get to see them have a girlfriend, boyfriend or whatever, um, or ever get married or anything like that. So I really felt I had a mission and a responsibility. And that kept me, pulled me along to be honest, those North stars. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I can't, I'm, I'm not a parent quite yet, but just, you know, imagining that situation and how yeah. you prepare to say goodbye to your children. And so many people are in those situations from diseases that we are learning could be preventable. And that's why it's so important to share stories like yours. And we're going to, we'll get to the, the miracles that you established here in just a second. But yes. at this point, sure. I want to just talk for a minute about what was your diet like at this point 
in, in your life and leading up to it? How had you eaten prior to, you know, discovering the whole food plant-based diet? Yeah. Well, I, I had tradition. I had had this growing up in the standard American diet. I came from Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, which is predominantly German in background. So, well, and my mom was a kind of Irish Canadian. And so we did have the sort of meat and potatoes focus. But my mom was really radical at the time because she we always had salad served. We always had whole wheat bread. It was like an exception if we ever had white bread. So and she actually used to not fry things, but broil them and bake them and that kind of thing. So she was I kind of I think ahead of her time of compared to my uh, peers going to school. And then um, I continued that diet until my husband and I uh, met each other. And then we sort of heard about, um, you know, we decided to be vegetarian because we felt, again, it was probably healthier not to eat meat, all the stuff we were reading about meat. And so we've been vegetarian for a number of years. And even then I was overweight. Um, I, you know, ended up being diabetic. So even that wasn't enough you know, have, still having dairy products, egg products, and that kind of thing. Um, and so that was kind of my diet at the time. And, um, and, and of course, I also included, you know, uh, potato chips were one of my number one things that I loved, Diet Coke, you know, those things were not helpful at all. I was not a big chocolate eater, but the, the sort of more, I like the more salty, savory type of things. And uh, so, and pizza was something that we all loved. And, you know, with extra cheese, of course, because we thought, boy, if we're vegetarian, we need to have that protein. And, um, and guess what, I don't think we looked in the mirror or on the scales really and thought about it that way, to get any kind of indication. And certainly a scale is not enough to tell you if you're healthy or not too. Uh, that's a, you know, I think that's people are beginning to understand that that you can be very thin, but very unhealthy as well. Absolutely. So, and that's what, yeah. that's what led us to uh, one day. I, uh, there was a, a speaker in Canada. His name is George Stropanopoulos. And he does a talk show like, um, would be like equivalent to a, like a Larry King. And it, he's a okay. younger version of a Larry King. So he's quite nationally mm -hmm. known. And he came on one day and he just said at the very beginning, and I was lucky because all I could hear is the TV. I couldn't really hear, like, you know, see anything much. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I just turned it on by chance. And he said at the beginning of his sort of opening lines is, he said, I've seen a documentary called Forks Over Knives. It changed my life. It just might change yours. That's all I'm going to say about it. Well, the mm -hmm. curious learner in me was like, what is this thing? What is this forks mm -hmm. over knife? Like I didn't, he didn't refer to diet or anything. He just said it changed his life. And I thought, I wonder what's going on. And so then I Googled it with my new kind of computer technology. I wrote to the producer. Mm -hmm. I found this works over knives that it was a documentary. I wrote to them because we're in kind of cow town, literally. That's called mm -hmm. Calgary. And it's way out west. And so we don't get things necessarily right away. And uh, even though we're a large city, um, it's slower. Americans get a lot of things first. And uh, mm -hmm. we're used to our neighbor, big brother next door, getting lots of stuff before we do. Yeah. And so they said, well, we don't know when it's going to come to Calgary. Well, they said, we'll try to let you know. And then finally mm -hmm. it did. I don't know if it was like about maybe nine months later it came. And um, it came to an alternate, what we call an alternative theater. And so mm -hmm. I had to climb up, if you can imagine, with a white cane, uh, a mustache, a, a plastic mustache in my nose, carrying a tank on my back. I had to carry, walk up two flights of stairs to get to the movie theater. It was on the top floor um, where they were playing that fun. They had a bottom floor near the theater and a top one. We went there, mm -hmm. we ended up going three times. So it was like me climbing Mount Everest each time. Um, and we wanted to take our kids and, uh, we took our oldest, then we took our two youngest. And of course my husband and I had first gone. And when we were sitting in the theater, listening to T. Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn, we turned to each other and we said, we, we got to do this. Like it just mm -hmm. made so much 
sense. It was like somebody had just lifted the veil, lifted all the mystery away, made common sense. Uh, there was mm -hmm. evidence behind it. And, you know, realizing there was no morbidity to trying this so that we could really be researchers. You know, we didn't have to say we're going to be lifers, but we could try it on safely and know we're not going to be harmed in any way. And in fact, probably more likely a side effect is better health. So it's a kind of win-win, you know, it's worth the chance. And so what we noticed, though, my husband pointed out to me, is every time we went, people always came in to the theater with, you know, the big bags of buttered popcorn. And he said what was amazing is he saw as he went down the aisles, all these bags, like three quarters full of popcorn. People did, stopped eating the popcorn during the movie. So that's how much they were impacted uh, by the wisdom of T. Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn. Yeah, that, that is a great documentary. If, if anybody listening or watching has not seen it, it will make you uh, go clean out your cabinets immediately after. And I want to just point out at this point too, so this when that documentary came out, you had been living very, very ill for the past five or six years at this point. Um, I had um, been blind for five years and I was mm -hmm. trying to, with Neil Bernard's work, I was trying to kind of do it, but I didn't quite understand it. I couldn't quite put it all together. And so we were trying to get looking at more vegan, but of course we went then to vegan stuff. Guess what? Mm -hmm. And of course you look at the vegan cheese, you think of, we didn't right. know, understand about looking at the fat. We didn't really, it didn't really click. And mm -hmm. uh, one day I was looking online and there was a woman who came up and said she had I think it was stage three can breast cancer and she had gone through so many treatments and I understand that from the nursing point of view all the chemo she'd gone through radiation and everything and, and the doctors had said hey you just got to stop your body's like exhausted and we're going to give you a break and so she started looking for alternatives she found Dr. John McDougall's uh, medical center and she went down there and did his program I think he has a he had a 10 day he has a 10 day program and it still exists now and she went there and she actually ended up reversing her cancer. And I was blown away. And I thought, I got to find out who this John McDougall is. I know they were, he was in the film, but I just didn't click again. I was so focused on T. Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn. But I also had done yeah. at the same time, after the film, I wrote to Caldwell Esselstyn and I got his mm -hmm. nurse and she said, I was amazed. I got this phone call and she said, Dr. Esselstyn wants to speak to you. Well, you might as well have said the Pope called or, you know, right. or, or the president <laughs> called or something. I was like so thrilled here, prime minister. I was like, oh my gosh, like the Beatles have landed. Dr. Essel wants to talk yeah. to me. And I got on the phone with him and I've used to surgeons having worked in the operating room and they're very direct, like just do this, 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 and this. They're used to being in charge. And he just said to me, First of all, you got to extinguish the diabetes. Get that. That's a fire within. Get a, get rid of it. We got to pour water on that. And then we're going to work on your pulmonary arterial hypertension. What he didn't tell me at the time, um, we ended up having him about, I think, uh, several years later as a gratitude project. I created a summit, Fork Smart Summit, mm -hmm. and we had him as a guest, our first guest. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, I'm taking the transplant money that I had been saving for a lung transplant because uh, it's very expensive here. It's not that the, mm -hmm. the operations covered, but all the incidentals of having to stay in another um, city, uh, you know, putting yourself up for almost a year at that, in that city. You have to have a partner that can't, can't be working at the time, some supporter. Mm -hmm. Like that's all very costly. Most people go into bankruptcy to do that kind of thing. And so oh we brought him to to the program because i said i want everybody else even if one person hears this message i want it out there and that was my gratitude project for the whole plant-based world but especially for dr esselson dr mcdougall um and dr t colin campbell who really made a difference in my life and um so he was very clear what i needed to do is i needed to create more nitric oxide in my body and i needed to eat nitrates and so like, that's like bok choy, uh, spinach, kale, uh, beets, beet greens, um, all of these things and arugula. And so we, I ended up, and he asked me to do that six times a day. 
for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, in between as snacks, between breakfast and lunch, and lunch and uh, dinner, and then at bedtime if possible. And he'd say a fistful, but he, I mean, if you've seen his hands, you're kind of like, how big is this? You know, it was about a yeah, cup serving. A and mm -hmm. it's a lot, but you know what? I, I just took it like, hey, this is better than pills. So I ended up having, originally, I had something like a whole page you can imagine a medication listed. I ended up getting down to only like two medications. That was it. And one was for my pH and the other was my B12. And then I had to add a bit of vitamin D. That's And that was it. And I was like, you know, I was off. I become diabetic free. So I was no longer when I went and I went to John McDougall Center as well. He had a five day program, mm -hmm. which was financially possible for us to make it as a result of mm -hmm. uh, some people contributing in the community for our cost to go because my husband had to go with me because I was blind at that time on oxygen and you couldn't travel by yourself. You can imagine me landing at the airport. And right. How the heck would I get there? You know? And so he had to take time off work and um, we went there and we went through the five day program, got to eat there, got to do the things. I couldn't see a lot, but I was sitting at the front so I could hear everything. And I just studied everything possible. We were busy from uh, something like eight in the morning, right till nine at night. And I was mm -hmm. learning, learning, learning. And that gave me some real confidence to get started really fully. Um, and based on Dr. Esselstyn, I was combining it with the six servings right. of these nitrates that everybody can benefit from. And mm -hmm. um, I got the his Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook as well. And uh, that was helpful. And so then I started to, I was blind, but I started to cook. And I didn't know at the time, because of course I couldn't see, is that they had sliced mm -hmm. mushrooms because I used to cut my hand cutting the mushrooms. Like I was so weak, I couldn't even stand at the island for more than probably a minute. So I'd have to sit in the dining room, cut all the vegetables. It would take me hours to do. Um, wow. But I would cut my fingers on cutting mushrooms. And then I found out they had sliced mushrooms, which I thought was a miracle. <laughs> I never knew that existed. It's a lot of things uh -huh. that blind people don't know exist. You know, it's kind of right. like discovering. Uh, things like that. And so I yeah. started making my meals. And I want to share honestly with everybody, they were not good. Like, even though I was trying to, you know, I, some recipes just turned out awful. And if someone had yeah, said to me, like, I'm not, yeah, I, and I'm not someone, if someone said a choice, you have to lecture with 400 people and do that, or you can cook them dinner i go i'll take the lecture like i i'm not someone i love to eat but the cooking part that's eh, pretty weak you know it's not my favorite thing to go to so i had to really kind of embrace it as this is a new creative art and i realized something i had had to stop working go on disability i thought i'm not going to give my legacy my kids a legacy of any financial worth i'm going to give them the legacy i'm going to give them is health and that they don't have to, at 40 years of age, be on cholesterol medication, be on high blood pressure medication, heading toward diabetes, all of the things like that. That's, to me, far more wealth than uh, any kind of monetary amount could, could buy. I think two things that you have made so clear right now that I just want to go over again is that so you were eating a vegetarian diet. It wasn't until you took all of those dairy, egg products, um, the processed foods, the oils. That's why we stress oils. here with the plant-based living that um, that you have to really encompass this whole food plant-based lifestyle. And, and it takes all of it to really achieve that optimal health. And it seems yes. like it's an impossible feat, but it's not. It, it really you you do have to relearn things and learn how to cook in your case but it can be done and you know some people who may be listening right now will say well come on no wonder she was motivated like look how sick she was oh my gosh right. like you know and like yes i will say i was in a major head-on car collision with my health uh but you know what what's interesting is uh, my husband and i started a support group uh, for pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, and they saw me improve. At times, I was in a—I had been in a wheelchair, a walker, using canes. 
they saw me improve. And even then, they were not willing to try eating the way I was eating. So, you you know, even when people are in a very severe situation, like a head-on car collision, that doesn't mean that's going to be the motivation to change them. It really has to come right. from within. And I say to people who are just learning, they're maybe diabetic or they've got high cholesterol. Guess what? That's a fender bender. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be in a major car club. You have a chance to to hammer out that that uh, fender bender and actually get mm -hmm. your health back. And so we yeah. all, you know, because we often look at all these success stories, and some people go like, "Well, I'm not that successful. I didn't do that. Like I didn't. Like I didn't lose the weight. Like my husband lost the weight faster than me. Well, guess what? Women have more carry more fat period so yeah. it is harder mm -hmm. but i'm saying hey don't get discouraged there's hope there and hope is a very powerful medicine um that you know what uh you can turn things around and imagine if you had like i keep going what if i hadn't found this and what if i hadn't mm -hmm. said i'm going to embrace it and i'm going to try the research on and try it for myself and give myself even 30 days or whatever like john mcdougall when i was at his program he said even he's, he challenged us. He said, instead of 30 days, give yourself at least, so you know, not, three months at least. So what I did mm -hmm. is I went to see him in December, which I thought was the best time to go, believe it or not, because it's the month where we allow ourselves to really indulge. You know, nobody kind of looks at you different if you grab some chocolate or you grab this or that, because after all, it's holidays, everybody can eat. It's a kind of free free get out of jail eating card. And so I thought if I can tackle Christmas and get through Christmas, then I can tackle any other seasons of the year. And so we went at the beginning of December, December 1st, in fact, and then I decided not until my birthday, April 8th, would I get off the program. And I thought, I'm just going to stick to it today or just to see what happens. And sometimes I went to bed dreaming of a banana split. Like, I don't know why, but, you know, I'd be thinking about that. And then but it was amazing. I couldn't believe this myself is when I came to my birthday, I all of a sudden I went, because I had promised on my birthday I could have anything I wanted. I mean, anything, you know, whether it's sweet or savory or whatever, but off, not off a whole, like off a whole food plant-based diet. And when it came April 8th, I felt so much better. I did not want to stray. I was not willing to stray. Uh, and yeah. that really helped because it takes about 30 days for your taste buds to change. It takes about 90 days and get used to not the salt level that we're used to in a standard American diet. Mm -hmm. And then 90 days to get over the fat craving. So it mm -hmm. really was helpful to allow myself that extended research period to see, hey, is this making a difference for me? And going all into it, not, you know, some people go into it Monday to Friday, holidays on the weekend. And you know what? You're yeah. all of a sudden, you're just going back how many more steps. So you really don't right. get a full effect of it at all. And so you have to give yourself enough time. And I wasn't able to exercise or anything. And I didn't even think about losing weight, to be honest with you, because I was just more concerned about could I breathe better? And, right. you know, could I, could I have a bit more energy to walk around? And mm -hmm. guess what? I ended up 15 months later, I got my sight back. I had lost, um, you know, was going on, I think about two years, I lost 110 pounds and I've been able to keep that off. And, you know, my sight, in fact, I went to the ophthalmologist who's a specialist in low vision. He said, it's actually improved from last year. You're actually wow. up one more, you know? And it's so cool. one more level. Yeah. So it's amazing that way that uh, like I am yeah. so I live with such a grateful heart for this. And so, mm -hmm. you know, while I would love other people to do it, people have to find it in their own way, in their own time. And that's that's the kind of loving acceptance I think we try to give other people around us who maybe are really uncomfortable with what we're doing because it makes them think maybe I should be doing this. And so. Mm -hmm rather than maybe trying it, sometimes they may put you down or exclude you or do something like that, that, that can feel really hurtful. And yet I still remember, I think, you know what, they're on their journey, I'm on mine. And I'm going to try to, I, I hope that they can respect where I am. And you can, I will respect where they're at. You know, that's you. And you brought up something so beautiful, I thought, too, is that, you know, even if people,
people can't find that why from within it, even if you're not at death's door to make this change, you're thinking about the legacy you're leaving your children and how their lives yes. are going to be better because you're teaching them to eat this way from a younger age. And so they may never have to deal with these things that you had to go through in your life. And I think if we can start to, to think of it that way as preventing our children from going through some of these chronic illnesses that we see every day, then that would be something that would change a lot of people's minds and the way they look at the, this eating yeah. this way. Well, it so inspired my son. And even though we recognize and T. Colin Campbell has that wonderful formula, like 80% food, 12% exercise, and the, the rest is heredity. My son was very concerned because there's diabetes in both sides of the family. And it really inspired him he ended up losing something like 75 pounds and really getting himself in shape. And um, he eats this way now and he's married and he has a partner who's come on board. And so, you know, without any kind of like, there's no finger wagging or anything like that. We try to be accepting. We know people have slips. I call them sudden lapses in planning uh, that happen to all of us. You know, we're out on the road or something like that. And the most important thing is to be as gentle and kind as we would with other people and be that with ourselves as we're going through this. Because this is not a sprint. This is not a diet that has a beginning and an ending. And oh, yeah, way we can celebrate afterwards and whatever. We're not doing it to just get into a dress or a suit or whatever. It's not just an appearance thing. We want to feel good all, all around. And so right. it's a marathon and it's a lifestyle. And so we're going to have bumps and along the way and detours. And it's just about getting back on track. So when I work with people, I do some whole plant-based coaching as well as personal counseling. I really encourage them to take that gentle, loving approach with themselves because uh, we don't want to mm -hmm. see food as the enemy. But there are foods that aren't, right. I would not even call them foods. And I've talked to um uh, uh, Colin about that myself. I've had dialogues with him and said, I, I'm disappointed that we call like all the oils food when it's really not, it's really confusing. And all the processed food, we refer to it as food when it's not really food, it's a man-made substance. And so it really mm -hmm. tricks people, unfortunately, and they think, oh, I'm getting food. And so we're not. And so the whole, more yeah, whole we can eat things, the healthier. Yeah. My husband likes to refer to those foods as Franken foods. So I like that term, yes. term because they really, yeah. I mean, they're not, not real food. And, and since yeah. we're talking, I mean, this is the proof of plant-based living and you really are walking proof of that. You know, I think your story in particular shows just how powerful food can be as medicine as opposed to drugs, because you know, pointed out you were on this long list of medications. Some of them cost uh, you know, close to a hundred thousand dollars a year, years. and that's none US. Of well, wow. we did the. And, we did and that. I, I was going to say, I had so many people not believe uh, my story. Like people said, mm -hmm. she, you know, they have media and everything. You know, she's a fake and everything, mm -hmm. and that really deeply um, uh, cut into me. You know, it was first I'm almost sure. worse than diagnosis because my integrity is only thing I have. And it's not for sale. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I, I approached uh, my husband is a PhD uh, theoretical chemist, and he does environmental research and sees the value of environmental health. And, uh, and then T. Colin, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, of course, at the Cleveland Clinic. So we th wrote a paper together. My husband was the lead writer. I contributed all the research, seven years of my all of my uh, studies and work because my blood was taken almost every month, sometimes every two weeks. So we had all this data and Dr. Elston contributed to the paper as well. And it got published in September, I believe, of 2019 in this new journal, Journal of D Disease Reversal and Prevention, all highlighting... Mm -hmm the evidence-based proof of whole plant-based eating. And so Amazing. I wanted to have that also for my kids because I didn't want someone to say, that's not true. She's making it up. She's exaggerating. She's, mm -hmm. she has something to sell. Um, I have, that's not my intention at all. We all have to earn a living, but I have no intention of falsifying anything for anybody. I want them to benefit if that's their choice to benefit. Uh, but I don't yeah. want them to not even know the information. That to me, uh, and I've had this talk 
with many doctors, it's a real ethical issue to not even share this as an alternative to it other is. treatments like the pills and procedures, that plants can be a tr true alternative and not cause people harm. So we did the also, mm -hmm. we included in the paper, the health economics. So for mm -hmm. from a hundred thousand dollars or about, and, and some drugs were, it's about 3000 a month. We were, I was probably spending about $5 a day in essence, because I was eating quite a lot of arugula because it has the highest level of nitric oxide nitrates uh -huh. and that increases the highest level of nitric oxide index so i just went for the big one <laughs> right. i want to shortcut it too. right to that yeah. and so i just steam the arugula i have it i have it layered in soup bowls i have it if i do a, a whole wheat pita pizza that's oil free i will put that on there i will put it in mm -hmm. pasta sauces i will put it wherever i can put it and sometimes i just eat it straight up with a little bit of nutritional yeast or a bit of vinegar on it. Those are great tips for people. And we just actually had Dr. Esselstyn on, he was our last interview and, and he talked about um, that exact thing and, and eating those five to six servings a day. So hearing from someone yes. who's done it and some tips on how to do it, I think is great for a lot of people. And one thing I love yeah. about, you know, you, we talk about going to the doctor and not hearing this way of treating diseases, but Ever. we have these, doctors in who have done the research who have treated patients who have seen the results uh dr esselson dr campbell and they are so willing i mean you were you talked on the phone to dr esselson after this happened and i love how available they make themselves because they are so sure yes. of how this works and they want to share it with as many people as possible well, I'm, I'm excited for all of you in, in the United States because Kaiser Permanente has kind of come on board and really helped promote uh, whole food plant-based uh, diets that doctors can access that. And that's really exciting because they see the health economics. I mean, it's really going to cut down on insurance costs and hospital costs. We spend a fortune even up in Canada on a medicine that's unnecessary. These are chronic diseases that are really born by the fork and the spoon and the knife, not anything else. You know, and we think that's a natural thing. I mean, I think there was recently a commercial for a burger company. I won't say the name because I don't want to give them extra credit. But they're talking about mm -hmm. a full meal being a snack at night now. Snack late. You know, there's that's a new theme. So we mm -hmm. that's why we got kids at grade seven who have diabetes and and you know, and they also and that's you know something that we thought would happen when someone type two diabetes would happen when someone in their seventies or eighties, they're getting it now in grade seven with fatty liver disease. So you can imagine they're not going to outlive their parents. That's what's really frightening. Right. And, and it's so unfair, it you know, mm -hmm. they don't deserve that kind of legacy at all. No, and it's time to do something for sure. So uh, again, let's just compare this. So in, in 2006, you were diagnosed, you had diabetes, you had uh, this rare disease that you would um, say that for me, pulmonary arterial hypertension, you had sleep apnea, you had right-sided heart failure, you were put on all of these medications, you went blind, uh, you went into kidney failure, you needed a lung transplant. And Six years later, you discovered a whole food plant-based diet and started doing that. Yep. And look how much your life has changed. Your sight is back. You no longer need the, the lung transplant. You're able to you know, live this life with your children and not have to worry. Your diabetes is gone. Um, and now you've taken this approach where you know, you're using not only your um, proof that that this works, but also your medical background and you're helping others. So talk yes. about some of that work that you're doing now, because I, I love what sure. you're doing. Yeah, uh, what I do is I do personal counseling and I use uh, what's called acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and it's really about helping people be psychologically flexible according to their values. So uh, psychological flexibility is about noticing uh, what's happening around you and what's going on. And at the same time, moving towards satisfaction in your life um, and uh, regarding who's important to you and what matters to you, even in the face of obstacles, like difficult thoughts and feelings, memories, and bodily aches and pains. So it's not a matter we say, hey, that stuff all exists, 
but we don't have to get caught up in it. We instead can look at what were we going to, how are we going to move toward um, a more satisfying life according to whom what's important to us. And I've used that all along. I am uh, in, in just facing my disease, who and what was important to me were, were obviously my kids and leaving them a legacy, uh, but letting them know that I would take worry away from them and I would try to stay as well as possible, do anything possible I could. So to show them that model and then also to try to make a contribution despite what I was facing, that I had that obligation to do that. And so those values really guided me. And then I had to go, yeah, I have these yucky feelings and thoughts. However, am I going to stay there and react? And or am I going to actually move toward what's really I want to do? What kind of satisfaction do I want in life? And so, you know, I started being able to coach people on whole plant based living, and mm -hmm. um, now do online counseling as well. Um, so that I can be helping people with a, a whole myriad of problems. Um, and then I do the whole plant-based coaching as a small portion of my practice. And I'm really enjoying it a lot. So, um, and I feel really fortunate, Dr. Esselstyn, I've been able to introduce him to more patients. He didn't share with me until years later that I was this first patient he had ever had with this rare disease. And he never wow. let on that at all. And so mm -hmm. he, he has since I've referred patients to him, he's been able to give them some uh, advice. And I know I've heard from people all around the world. And um, I've had reports back, they've improved their right heart casts approved, they've stayed sable. And uh, what I didn't share with uh, in our paper was that I was I was on a lot of experimental drugs that were very harsh, mm -hmm. kind of like a chemotherapy experimental level of drugs, because what they're trying to do is just slow the disease down. And, you know, my specialist said, all I'm looking at is trying to keep you alive, but they don't think about your eyes, your liver, your lungs. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. And that's where we have to say, we got to find something that takes care of all our body parts, not just what mm -hmm. our specialist is looking at. And one of the things is I ended up having end state and I still live with end stage kidney failure when it was diagnosed in 2013. And now it's 2021. I'm not on dialysis. I'm still alive and functioning. Mm -hmm. And my kidney functioning right now is about uh, 9%. And yet I have no symptoms and I'm still functioning. And like, that'll probably be another paper we'll want to write to have give hope to people Absolutely. who are on uh, kidney dialysis, because there's a lot of emphasis for people uh, with kidney problems to eat more protein. And we know, and T. Colin Campbell has been a leader in this, yes. of the damage of more protein. When we make a single kind of nutrient, the king or queen, it's a real mistake. Mm -hmm. We need that rainbow on our plate. We need a variety mm -hmm. of things to be able to eat. Our body is complex and we should treat it that way um, and yeah. uh, not try to simplify it to one nutrient, but to have that complexity right. and really enjoy our food. Eat for our biological need, but eat it deliciously. Yes, absolutely. Great way to put it. And Kate, where can people connect with you and, and you know, get some counseling from you if they need it. I know sure. you also do a lot Absolutely. of demonstrations and summits. Yep, I do live webinars. We'll be stopping for the summer, but but they can go on my um, Crowdcast channel, Toward Moves, and take a look at all the broadcasts I've already done on different aspects of uh, eating a whole plant-based lifestyle. And you can reach me at towardmoves.com. That's towardmoves.com and reach out by email at kate at towardmoves.com. Uh, but you can also go on my website because I have stories or if you look up my name as well, you'll see a number of mm -hmm. stories um, about yeah. my journey. Yeah. Kate, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story. I could talk to you for several more hours if we had the time. Um, and you can just tell how passionate you are and how much you care about other people um, wanting to share this with them and help as much as possible. And I just can't thank you enough for that. You're an amazing demonstration of what a plant-based diet can do um, that really helps the, the drugs, surgery, and other medical treatments just often cannot do. So um, really important for people to hear. 
So thank you uh, as well for listening and watching today to the Proof of Plant-Based Living, and we will see you next time.